talking about faith, faith. It's funny, when I started to prepare for this message, I wanted to go a completely different route because I wanted to talk about faith. What, what does faith do? How does faith enable you? And I just kept being drawn back to so much of the, the imagery of the shield and really how we use our faith and how we take care of our faith and how our faith aids us just in the day-to-day. And so um, I'm looking forward to sharing this, uh, sharing with this, sharing this with you today. Um, let's pray and then we'll dive in. Father in heaven, our faith is found in the word. And so, Lord, I pray for every one of us, God, who has not been topped off in our faith today or, or we're just lacking or, or, or maybe we need to figure out how to care for it better. I pray, let your word, God, just, just sound, God, an echo over and over and over again, God, to remind us of how significant and how important your word is. I pray that your word would bring us faith, as your word says. And I pray we walk out of here, Father, a people of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In all circumstances is how Paul starts this off. In all circumstances, if you've got the KJV, it says above all. But let me just bring some clarification to that. Paul's talking about the shield of faith, and he's not saying this is more important than anything else. What he's saying is, is this needs to go first in position not in importance. Your faith is what leads the way. When you take a step forward, it's because you trust and have faith, even though the circumstances are not what you want them to be, still yet you put that shield and you press forward, hoping that everything you believe is exactly um, what you know it to be. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Just as the breastplate depended on the word of God, so does the shield find its foundation on the belt of truth. You you have no faith apart from the word. Faith is a result of the impartation of God's word into the human heart. That's exactly what that is. Faith is, is, is God imparting into you through his word Um, faith to to move mountains, to speak to those things in your life. In fact, I would say this, the presence of your faith is directly tied to the presence of the Word in your life. If you would say, Pastor Scott, I need more faith, I would say you need more Word because those things are inseparable. To say it a bit differently, let me say it like this. The presence or absence of faith is determined By the presence or absence of God's word, for faith and the word of God are inseparable. Let me say it again. The presence or absence of faith is determined by the presence or absence of God's word, for faith and the word of God are inseparable. How do we know that? What does scripture tell us? Romans 10, 17, very clear. You guys already had it in your mind. You're like, I know he's going to say it. I know he's going to say it. So it says this. So faith comes from Hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says this, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. And in Romans 4, Paul talks about this concerning Abraham. Abraham had faith because God gave him a word to trust in. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that our preaching is empty and your faith is in vain. If Jesus didn't raise up from the dead, which all of Scripture hinges upon the resurrection. The Word not only um, gives us faith, but if we don't have the Word, um, then we're, we're susceptible to many different things. And so here's what the Word keeps us from believing. Ephesians 4, 14 says this. It says, um, uh, tossed to, keep from being tossed to, or fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So we see the Word of God absolutely keeps you from every wind of doctrine. And I don't know if you know it or not, but there's a lot of winds out there. And trust me, they just winds. <laughs> they just winds. By human cunning, and there is a lot of that, and craftiness and deceitful schemes, all those are by design. But just as the faith rests upon the Word of God, so does the shield of faith rest upon the belt of truth. 
So just know, as we deal with faith, as you grow your faith, you will grow your faith in proportion of you getting into the Word. How can you believe in something if you've not read it for yourself? How can you trust in the promises and the character of God if you've not read it? Read it and be encouraged. Read it and find yourself growing your faith. So when Paul is talking about faith, he says, um, he uses it in the, the imagery of a shield. I struggled with this for a while, but then I began to understand what he was kind of going after. Uh, when you look at the shields of a Roman soldier, there were actually two different types of shields. There was a one that was used for defense and a one that was used for decoration. Now, I do not believe that Paul was talking about our shield of faith in terms of decoration, but that does not mean it's not being used. And so I, I want to look at that this morning the word that they used, the, the soldiers used, was a type of shield called the clippius. And the clippius, was, it was used when a soldier would march down uh, the street in a parade or some type of celebratory event. It was light. Now, remember, I'm not talking about a shield, right? We're talking about what? So today we're going to talk about faith this morning. <laughs> Y'all just flunked the, pad, flunked the test right then. So a shield equals faith, and faith equals a shield. Here we go. All right. So they will walk down the, the road in a parade or some kind of a celebratory event, and they were holding their shield, which was really their faith. And this, this Clippius shield was a shield that was light, small, an ornate shield, a very decorative shield, and it served to tell past victories. It told about what the man did. It was a comfortable shield, easy to manage. Are you following me this morning? It was a comfortable shield, easy to manage. Its purpose was to highlight what man had done and to emphasize man's involvement and part in the victory. And it did so by celebrating the past victories uh, through the use of decoration. It was also used to depict the greatness of those who never entered the battle. Imposters, such as magistrates and high-ranking officials, as a way to celebrate their victories while they were in office. And so here what you see is simply this. People who had these shields that make them look like they're part of something that really mattered. They were part of the victory or part of the battle, but those shields weren't real victories for them, they were just borrowing it for what? For influence, for appeal. I'm still talking about faith this morning. For anything else that they could do to benefit them, they used those shields so that way you looked at them in a higher measure, not because they had bought in to what the shield actually did. You see, this is not the shield Paul is talking about, but that does not mean that some people are not using this shield. It doesn't take much effort to look at, I'm sorry, look around our country and see that there are soldiers who are carrying the Clippius shield, a faith that is easy to manage, that emphasizes the man, that's light and celebrates man's involvement. And selling it instead of facing and, and putting our eyes upon Christ who gives us our faith. And so just like in Rome, what we see is this, is that temptation to use the faith as something ceremonial or symbolic. I don't know about you, but I've grown up in plenty of church life to know that I have seen plenty of Clippius shields, people whose faith do not stand the test, people whose faith make them look good, but Jesus is lost in the middle of it all. People whose faith, that only, the only reason why they carry that is that they want you to think that they are part of the battle too. That they belong to something greater too. That they look good. That they feel good. That they're associated to something that you're associated to. But they've not suffered. They've not went through trials and tests. They've not tested that shield. But somehow they have found faith. One of my friends called me one day. He said, he said Scott, you'd be so glad I, I found faith. And I said, you found Who? I found faith. I said, bro, I didn't know she was, I didn't know she was available. What you talking about? What's, what's, what's faith been up to? He says, no, man, I, f- I found faith. Like, I, I found belief. I said, that's good, brother, but unless you found Jesus, it don't matter. 
It don't matter. I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what faith you have. Unless your faith is in Christ Jesus, not some, not, not some law, not some ceremony, not some tradition, not some church name, not some heritage, not some pedigree, not none of that stuff. Unless your faith is in Christ alone, you have the wrong faith. And so this morning, Paul is talking about this shield, and he says, these people grab this shield, and this shield is a small shield. It opens us up to the flesh. Reveals the flesh. And Paul speaks to that in Romans. He says, he says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hebrews 11.6 11, 6 says this, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So a true faith is not about how great we look, how spiritual we are, how many battles we've won, or any other spiritual resume. Our faith should point to the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So then what's this shield that Paul is talking about? What's he talking about here? He says that this is a defensive shield. Go ahead and show that, that the big red shield. There it is. That's the big defensive shield. Now, it's a, I couldn't find anything that was actually real. They, they had one uh, that was too small. Couldn't blow that up big enough. But this shield is very large. and In fact, it's built like a door. The Greek word for this shield Theodoros is actually means door. Um, if we look at the shield of faith and another part of Scripture, this is how it reads. Look at Acts 14, 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a shield of faith to the Gentiles. Now, funny enough, we translated a door of faith, but in the Greek, it's the exact same phrase as a shield of faith. So what we see is that our faith is like a door. It's big enough to cover you. That's the emphasis. It's the door of faith that we walk through. And so when, when, when the Lord gives us faith, you need to know that your faith is great enough to cover you. Look at Romans 12, 3. Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul is telling us that God has assigned to us a measure of faith that will cover the measure of the man. The faith that you need is directly in proportion to the man or woman that you are. But sometimes we get caught in the comparison and we see that their faith and we go, man, if I had faith like so-and-so, if I had faith like Moses and Joshua, but you're not those people. The Lord has given you the faith that you need for whatever task is ahead of you. And as the task grows and the man or the woman grows, so shall the faith grow. But you need to understand that everything that you need in terms of faith, God has given to you. And if it's not sufficient, then go back to his word and find more of it because it is there waiting for you. I fear that all too often... We use our faith to make much of the man. I hear in conversations around town, I'm talking to people and things back home, I hear this spirituality that people use. They're talking about their relationship with God, and it's almost in a tone of boast. And I think to myself, why, why, why does it matter? Why does it matter that, that, if, if, that you really believe? This is not the culture. Our country is not the country that you're somebody big and special because you believe in God. In fact, it's the opposite. So why in the world would you brag about something that's not true to you? I can tell you this, that our faith is not a decorative badge for parades, but a divine shield for protection. It's not a decorative badge for parades. It's a divine shield for protection. It, when you walk into your work, when you walk into your family, when you walk into this church, when you walk wherever it might be, you need to know that the reason why your faith is great is because the enemy is after you. You need to have something that will protect him uh, from you. And so our, our faith was given to us for function, not fame, not following, and not the favor of man. So the saying goes, function determines form. So let's look at the construction of faith. The Roman soldier's shield was made of um, a wooden carcass, and then they had six layers of animal hide stretched across it, tanned hide, and then it was uh, rimmed with a, a piece of brass around it and painted for 
um, a representation of what squad you were a part of, and most importantly, Roman army. And so what we see is simply this, is when I, when I see that uh, these six layers, they were pulled tight and they were woven in such a way that they say that this, this construction uh, of this shield was as strong as steel. So it could withhold a great deal, but the fact of the matter is that it was still just animal hide, right? Animal hide would eventually break down over time. But can I tell you something I saw that's not necessarily in the text that just spoke to Scott Brandon? I'll just share it with you. When I realized that here is this shield that protects them, right? But for them to make this shield, something had to die. And I thought it was unique that it was six layers because six represents man, and I know a man who died so I could have faith. Now, I don't know if Paul meant that to me or not, but I know one thing that when I talk about the shield of faith for me, Scott Brandon thinks, you know what, I only have faith because there was this man, a God-man, who gave his life and died for me. And because he did that, now I can have faith. But to keep this faith from breaking and upholding in the battle, here's what we had to see. Every day, uh, a soldier was given a routine. And his routine was simply this. He was to wake up in the morning and to grab his shield and to grab a little vial of oil and begin to take a little piece of a um, cloth and saturate that cloth and begin to rub that shield. And the reason why he rubbed that shield was because over time, those hides would begin to dry out and crack and become brittle. And so if he did not take care of his shield, I'm still talking about faith this morning, just so you know. As, he, as, as, he's, still talking, as he's still dealing with his shield, if he didn't take care of his shield in the morning, then, then he may face death that evening. And what I found it to be unique was simply this, is that, I struggled my whole life trying to get up and read the Word, and, and um, uh, whether it be evening or noonday. Or, but I have found the best time for Scott Brandon is the morning because this, this one reason alone, and I am not a morning person. It's just grit. You know, that's all it is. If you're, if you're a morning person, God bless you, but it's just grit for Scott Brandon to get up. Um, but what I notice is this, and maybe for you too, that when I don't spend time in my Word or with the Lord in the morning, it seemed like hell got an email. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and they're like, okay, Scott, it's been time, so guess what? We're full board today, guys. And I constantly beat myself up because I, 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 I tell myself, well, I didn't really get time like I wanted to. I'll just spend it later this evening. And I'm telling you, I am so exhausted and beat up emotionally by that day if I had just got up in the morning and rubbed oil on my shield spent time in the presence of the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit, who is a symbol of oil, right, uh, to, to anoint me and anoint me for my day and anoint my family. And so let me just encourage you this, this morning is that you and I, we have this thing called faith. And every morning you get up with it. And you are a soldier in the army of the Lord. And when you walk out of your house, sometime before you walk out of your house, we walk directly onto the battlefield. Sometimes taking our feet out of the bed hits the battlefield right away. And I would tell you is that the first thing that you and I should be doing is reaching for the oil and anointing our faith. And anointing our faith. We need that. Boy, the soldier didn't take care of his shield, then it began to crack and fail him. And I would tell you, my father-in-law used to tell me this. He said, Scott, we take care of our stuff so our stuff could take care of us. And this is so true here. But even to further that sentiment, I would say this. A faith that has a lack of care is a faith that hopes for a lack of conflict. Isn't it true? When we don't take care of our faith, we're hoping we don't face conflict. Because our faith, our shield is the one thing that's protecting us holding us in a place of shelter and refuge. But when we fail to take care of our faith, really what we're, we're praying and we're hoping is, Lord, please don't let anything come my way because I don't have anything to protect me. And so we're, we're, we're hoping the Lord's just going to give us a pass today. But here's the thing. The Lord is not trying to give you a pass or give you a pass. The enemy could care less about your passes. He wants you and your family and you have an assignment upon your head and your life. You have a target upon your name, and he is coming for you. And so we cannot simply hope 
that Satan will wake up today and say, yeah, it's Sunday, it's the Sabbath, let them have a day off. That ain't going to happen. And so when we, when we exhibit the idea that we have a lack of care for our faith, it's because we're hoping for a lack of conflict. Now look at what the shield con- contrasts in, in our text. Ephesians 6.16 says this, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith <clears throat> with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Uh, the ancient Greek writer Eucydides, he talked about this. He said uh, that there, these were terrible arrows, especially equipped with fire. They were filled, the canes of them were hollowed out, and they were filled with combustible liquids that when they hit impact, they would burst into flames. So when they shot them, you did not see flaming arrows coming at you until they bust around you. And the reason why they did this was so that they would create chaos and distraction. They were not a really efficient arrow. Uh, they, 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 the cane bust. All they were trying to do was just basically throw some, um, uh, some fire bombs over there. But here's what it did, and it was very effective at it. The reason why they shot those arrows was simply this. They wanted to create chaos and panic. See, Roman army, they, they had a really good uh, way to fortify themselves and to create solid encampments with their shields and their, their discipline. And so the enemy would come and try to figure out a way for them to break rank or to break structure. And the best way to do that was to expose their weaknesses from within because they knew from without they were too, they were, they were too tough. They couldn't, they couldn't penetrate their discipline and their equipment. So they would create these fires or these explosions that would cause them to panic or set other things on fire that would cause them to be distracted. And so here's what we see is this, is that Paul is talking about this same type of arrow. There are three different types of arrows that the Roman army was up against, and this was the third one. It was a special one. It wasn't used very much at all. But Paul's alluding to it, flaming darts, saying this, is that the enemy uses things against us to create chaos and fear and panic and to use the things that are within you that are under your feet, that are around you, to create fear. So you'll respond in your weaknesses because, you know, the enemy has no right to anything else in your life. The one thing he's always after is your emotions. If the enemy can get your emotions, you know he's got you, right? All the men in the house who ever stumped their toe and had anger come to their fists, you know what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example. Last Sunday I was... uh, coming to church, and something grabbed my attention, and so I went to deal with that. I turned back around, and I misjudged the door. I had my hands out in faith, uh, but I had no shield, and I just field go the door right there, boom, right? So I'm, and I'm in a hurry to get out of the door, and I just smoked myself right there on, on my eyebrow. And if you see me today, I got this big old bruise. No, it's not me and Julie. Uh, but, um, but when, you know, when I hit that, I'm, when, it, when it hit me, you know, when I hit it or it hit me, don't you know how I felt right in that moment? Flaming darts. You know what I mean? Flaming darts. I'm telling you, it's early. I can't see. I'm trying to get to church. And I'm about to go pray. I'm going to leave home and come here and pray. And what happens? Boom. I'm, I'm walking around here all Sunday morning, last Sunday, and I cannot focus because I just feel this boom, boom, boom. And here's what the enemy here's wants to do. He wants to get into your emotions. He knows how to tap into you. He knows how to get you distracted. And so he sends these, these darts after us. In fact, this same word here that is used to declare what, who is sending these arrows is called ponoritos. And it's the same word, it's it's called evil one here in 616, but it's the same word that we see in Mark 721. Here's what I want you to see. The enemy is shooting flaming darts at us, but he's aiming for things inside of you to wake up because he knows he can't put evil in you. He knows it's already in you. And he's trying to bring it out. Pastor Scott, what are you talking about? Did you just say I was evil? Well, let me show you what the word says. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 says this, For from what? Within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, 
foolishness, all these things, all these evil things, poneros, come from within and they defile a person. Notice it comes from within. It's the reason why the enemy knows all I got to do is get a hold of your emotions and I can pull those things out of you. All of a sudden you're breaking down, you're deconstructing because of the emotions that we've allowed our enemy to, to have access to. That's the reason why James tells us, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Everybody has a temptation. Everybody has a button. Amen? Everybody has a weakness. And the Lord is telling us today that your shield of faith is what keeps us from being susceptible to the attack of the, of the enemy because we know that at some point, at some time, he's going to launch his darts at us. And when he does, where are your emotions going to be? Where's your faith going to be at? And so we need to make sure that we are guarded because here's the, here's the real issue. Our problems in life are not the enemy. We are the problem. Right? The, the enemy can't do what he wants to do because Colossians 2.15 tells me that Christ has overcome him. He has brought him out in open shame, triumphing over all of him and his weapons. So I know that there's no battle yet to be won. It's been won. But the enemy is trying to remind you that you don't have authority, that you don't have jurisdiction, and you don't rule over your emotions, and he's trying to bring you into the game of flesh and blood. But we've got to stand back and hold up our shield of faith that is derived from the Word of God that hangs on our belt and say, not today. And so I don't know where you struggle with those things, but let me just remind you, don't get angry at your neighbor for leaving the trash five feet on the other side. Don't get angry at your wife. Don't get angry at your kids. Don't get angry at your boss. When things are going bad, step back and say, where am I in all, in all of this? Where are my emotions at in all of this? Because we can, only, we can only act in the measure that we allow him to control us. And if, if we're not walking in faith, then he'll definitely expose us. How do we prevent those flaming darts from hitting our shield. When the battle was raging, soldiers would take their shield right before they went in and they would dip their shield down into the water. And they would hold their shield there until the, the animal hives become immersed and saturated with water. And then it would be wet. So that way when this, this, this dart hit the shield, then the fire would be extinguished right away. When I read that, I realized... Ain't that something? So here we have this shield being immersed in the water. And as the shield is immersed in the water, there is a change of the shield's nature taking place. Because if the shield had never been in the water, it still would have, it still would have operated and functioned like normal tan hide would have. It had caught fire. But dipping it and immersing it in the water changed the nature of the shield can I tell you that when you take your faith and you immerse it in the Word of God, then you are cleansed and made brand new. That's the reason why you're not susceptible to those flaming darts anymore. So let me just back up really quick and just say, if you feel like you're constantly under attack and he's exposed in this part of your life and your emotions are constantly exposed over here, let me just tell you, get right back into the Word of God because he will... Change your nature as you immerse yourself in the water of his word. I want to say last but not least, he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. Can I show you a, a, an illustration on how important this word take up is? So um, can I have some guys, uh, where's my guys, Colton? And Josh uh, and uh, Matt, uh, come on up here. Kenny, yeah, y'all come on up here. I want to show you something. So the shield, the shield, when you brought these soldiers together, the shield had a hinge on both sides of the shield, had a hinge. And so as these, as these soldiers came together, there was a powerful thing at work here. 
Okay, now, Matt, you're going to be the bad guy, all right? You're going to be the bad guy. All right, so y'all make a big line, uh, shoulder to shoulder, in the back, out to the front, just like that. So you come up here, Michael, and then Kenny, you back there, make a straight line, just like this. One, two, three, there you go, just like that. Now, what would happen is they would stand next to each other, and they would link up shields, just like this, okay? Now, let me show you what happens if you don't link up shields. All right, Matt, I'm, I don't feel great. I've been healed, but I don't feel absolutely great. Can I tell you, this church is safe. We got some big boys in here, you know? All right. Come at me, brother. Push, just push me back. Push me back. Come on. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. See, that's how it is when we stand alone in our faith. That's why it's so important for you to come, to, come together with the body of Christ, right? And so these shields had an hinge. And so we would leak up. They would do this on the, on the battlefield. Now, Come on, let's try it again here. All right, now push. Come on, come on, Tiny, let's go. Let's go. All right. Here's what I want you to know. Y'all stay right there. Here's what I want you to know. I spent my strength not resisting the conflict. I spent my strength on connecting with my brothers. Do you hear what I'm saying? You see, we oftentimes get so caught up And trying to resist the devil, right? But really, when we're going through a hard time, all we really need to do is spend our strength to link up. It's just a link up. Because I don't have to be strong anymore. Because now I got my brothers next to me. And I know that no matter what's coming at me, they got what I don't got. And so it's important to be on this line. But not only that, but check this out. So so as we're linked up here, now pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. <laughs> yep. All right. Now, see, here's what's happening is, is now we, we feel the struggle, all right? Are you good? We feel the struggle is that even if I am not being attacked, the fact, see, Colton didn't say, I need, a, I need some help down here on row three. He didn't call out to me. I was already connected with him. I felt that pull, and I knew that Colton needed me. He didn't have to send me an email or a text or nothing like that. But when our faith is so connected in the body of Christ, I can feel weakness that is happening down here. He needs my strength, and I can begin to reallocate where I'm at so that we can center ourselves and strengthen those who are weak. Sometimes when you're on the end, you ever feel like you're on the end before? You're on the end, they come right at you. Then we can feel you all the way down there, and the Roman army would simply do this. They would break rank. And they would bounce on the other side and link up shields. And where this was a weak spot, it now became the center of conflict. And that the center of conflict was always the strongest. Always the strongest. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your help. Here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to know. In the body of Christ, Paul says, take up. Really what it means is simply to say, Take again. Take again. He says, you've put down your shield. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus knew their doctrine. Ephesus knew their word. But he says, for some reason, Ephesus, you have lost your ability to overcome the daily battles. And so he says, hear me, church. Take up again your shield of faith. Take it up again. Now, why is it that we lay our shield down? I would say this morning there's a couple reasons why. First off, we lay our shield down when we felt like our shield didn't help us in the past. We prayed, but there was no answer. We prayed, but there was no rescue. So we put down our shield. Or maybe, you know, you've never realized that you even needed a shield. What I tell you today is is what the Word would say to you through His Word is to take up again. I don't know what hurt you've been through. I don't know what pain or suffering or conflict or pressure that you're going through. But all I would ask you to do is to get back on the line. Take up again your shield and get back on the line. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm just going to pray this morning for two things. And if this is you, I want to pray for you. I just want you to raise your hand just so I know who I'm talking to. 
every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would say, Pastor Scott, oh, I don't know if I can take up that shield again. I felt heavy. I felt alone. I don't know if that's what I want to do, but I feel the calling to it. I feel the calling to get back on the line. And I feel like today, I want to take back up my shield of faith. I want to take back caring for it again. I want to immerse it in the word of, of, of the water of the word today. Show me how to care for it. If that's you, if you want to get back on the line, raise your hand for me. Let me see. Amen. Yeah. I see those hands. Thank you. If you would say, Pastor Scott, I've, I've never been on the line, never really had a shield of faith. But I think today I want to change that. If that's you, can I see your hand? Just let me know. We're ready to embrace the shield of faith today. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the, the faith that you give us because of the word that you've given us, because of the son that you've given us. And I pray, Father, that out of all of that's been given to us, God, once again, give us the strength, Lord, to take up again the shield of faith that we can walk, Father, in your army, declaring your authority, declaring, God, your ability, Father, over our life and over our family, over our world. God, give us strength, Lord, to take up that shield once again. Help us to get back on the line and to walk in power. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to our brothers and our sisters, God, to the left and to the right. God, when they're under pressure, when they're under conflict, God, help us to focus our strength next to us and that on the conflict, God. I pray, unite our hearts, tie our hearts together, Lord, this morning. And God, for that person who's never been on the line, I pray, God, you would breathe in them, God, a brand new life. Give them, God, a brand new shield. And let them walk in the measure that you've blessed them with. We love you, Lord, this morning. We ask your, your anointing to be upon us. Help us to dive into the word. Help us to anoint our shield every morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Is God good? Amen. When you get out of here, find another shield to link up to before you go. Let them know you love them. God bless you. I have a great weekend.